Okay, so a lot of political reporters, including me, got into this business because we're word people and not so fantastic with numbers. But unfortunately, as it turns out, there are not just facts, but a whole lot of figures that are involved in covering politics. Budgets, for example, and campaign finance reports. But thankfully for me, there are people like Nyberg's Bill Mahoney in the world. Bill is a master Excel spreadsheet maker. He's a veteran finance report numbers cruncher, despite his tender age. And his regular updates on days like this one, when candidates from all over the state are releasing their fundraising totals, are a total godsend to me. And Bill, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me, Liz. Are you thoroughly embarrassed now? <laughs> as much as I could be, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's, um, you brought us some charts, which is great, and let's pop yep. the first one up on the screen and uh, talk a little bit about it. So this is total raised over a three and a half year period, and uh, we can see actually that Spitzer did a lot of raising and actually outraised Cuomo. Now, I, th I was surprised by this because Cuomo's got $23 million on hand. Yeah, um, Attorney General Cuomo announced today that he raised $9 million, as he mentioned earlier in the program. And that puts him up to about $18 million raised for the campaign as a whole. And as you can see, that's not quite where former governors Pataki and Spitzer were. He's slightly below them, although he is above all the candidates who have lost the previous gubernatorial elections. Um, but fortunately for him, he hasn't been spending as much money early in the campaign as his predecessors did. So he's got a lot more in the bank than anybody has before him. Right now, he's actually got $23 million, which breaks every previous record going back throughout New York State history. This is actually interesting in part because he is talking about cleaning up Albany and cracking down on special interests, but the reality is that in order to get money, you need to get it from people with money, which is special interests, and exactly. or rich people. Yeah, we have seen in the past that for the first three years of the campaign, the previous numbers we saw, he had actually gotten more money from lobbyists than anybody else in Albany during that time. And we haven't seen the list of who's given him money this year so far yet, but right. I wouldn't be surprised if it's once more from the special interests who are usually the heavy donors in Albany. Right, and his argument has been, well, you know, I'm a guy who has a lot of integrity, and when you yeah. elect a guy with integrity, you know that, you know, I'm not going to do people favors just because they're giving me money. Yeah. He also, yeah. interestingly, hasn't spent any of the money or much of the money, and he's not on the air at this point. Now, Elliot Spitzer was on the air at this point, and he was spending quite a bit more at the time, even though his race wasn't, you know, similarly, I mean, he was running against John Faso, and we, he wasn't exactly. much of a contest. Yeah, um, Spitzer also had a primary, too, against Tom Swazi. Right. That wasn't much of a contest either, or at least most people viewed it correctly as right. such. Right, right. But he did make an early push to start getting on TV nonstop as soon as the convention happened, and even beforehand, I believe. While Cuomo didn't even announce until two-thirds of the way through the year so far, so he has not been spending money beyond buying a Winnebago, not anywhere near the rate that Spitzer <laughs> apparently, has. Yeah. Apparently with not great AC, he yeah. needs to check out that Winnebago, perhaps it was a lemon. Okay, we should note that uh, Rick Lazio, we don't know anything about Rick Lazio's numbers yet. We, um, he has until tonight, and he could, I don't think he will, but he could postmark it and send it in, but I think we'll be seeing it tomorrow. And as of mid-January, he had like 600000 didn't he? He didn't have a lot in the bank. Um, he had only raised $1.5 million um, in the last filing period. and. Chances are his number won't be that much higher than that. It's possible he could double or triple that, but I don't think anybody's expecting to see him put up a number anywhere near what Attorney General Cuomo has put up. Yeah, it's going to be, um, cash-wise, it's not going to be much of a contest. Presumably, yes. Uh, so let's pop up the next one, the sure. next graphic that we have here. This is money in the bank as of July. So let's go through this one. <laughs> There's a lot of discrepancy there. Yeah, you can see, once again, the candidates who have won the past two elections are up there towards the top, well ahead of the people who lost out to them. This shows how good of a bellwether money in the bank is for how the elections end up turning out. It obviously remains to be seen whether this year will continue that trend, but if so, it's good news for Cuomo. Right, who is, as we mentioned earlier, when this, in the Siena poll, he's double digits ahead of his would-be Republican yes. opponents. Now, the interesting thing also is, you know, there have been a lot of proposals over the years, including, I think, NYPERC supports campaign finance reform that would, that would include some public financing. Yeah, it would make it easier for the candidates who are lesser known, the Rick Lazios and Carl Palladinos of the state, to get more money than they are able to get now. And it would also make it possible for somebody like Attorney General Cuomo to get money from smaller donors. Instead of going out trying to get the $50,000 checks like he's been doing, 
you can start relying on the $500 or $1,000 donors, and then some of that money would be matched by a voluntary fund, which would therefore make him less reliant on these special interests. Yeah, the problem with that, though, is then when you have a person like a Bloomberg, for example, or a self-financer like a Carl Palladino, you uh -huh. can't limit how much money they spend, right? That's the so U.S. Supreme Court says that spending money is like, is like protected speech. Yeah, but you can also make it easier for the people who are running against them to catch up. If you've got somebody like a Bill Thompson, for example, who is millions of dollars behind in the fundraising race, right. he the ballpark would be a little bit more. Yeah, he's the new former level. New York City controller who ran against Bloomberg in the 2009 mayoral. He came much closer. Actually, spent he was. I mean, just today we found actually Bloomberg turned out to have spent 109 million dollars. That's almost a uh, million dollars more than we thought it was because we got this new report. Yeah. And I should actually point out that Bill Thompson actually did have matching funds, so I guess that wasn't the best example, but he, <laughs> he was able to dedicate less of his time to fundraising than he otherwise would have been able to, and that perhaps enabled him to get as close as he did in the polls. So a lot of people are talking about, we've spoken a lot on this show about the dysfunction of the state legislature and how much voters just love to hate the state lawmakers. So we have another yeah. one here. Let's pop that up on the screen. All right, this is difficult to see a little bit, so let's go through what this means. Well, this compares the numbers for the two parties in Senate races. Each of these numbers, each of these graphs represents the total money raised by all the candidates running for Senate from each of the parties. Blue is Democrats and red Republicans, obviously. Right, right. Uh, we don't have all the numbers for this year yet, so the numbers for both of those graphs on the right will go up a little bit. But as you can see, that it's flipped from previous years. Republicans had always outraised Democrats, but this year it's looking pretty good for Democrats. They've raised significantly more than their competitors so far. Right, and because they're in, that's because that the Senate Democrats are now in the majority, and the majority rules. Again, this is about where you put the money. Interests who give money want to give money where they think they're going to get the most bang for their buck, yeah. and so they give it to the Democrats because the Democrats are in control. Though we've seen not so fantastically in control in, yeah. in the Senate these days. Yeah. If I'm an interest group who's trying to influence a budget for whenever that gets finalized, I'd rather give to the party that has the slight majority and can presumably write most of the language than the party that's in the minority and won't be having as big an impact. So is your, your predictor for the governor's race when we saw that last thing with the bars that, that indicated that the people who had the most money were the people who won in, in the governor's races in the past, mm -hmm. does that also translate to state legislative races that the money actually is a good predictor of who's going to win? Historically, even more so than the gubernatorial races. Uh, for the last chart, we actually left out for, um, Tom Galasano, who had financed himself. Oh, I forgot about that. And there that. have been a few self-financed candidates and a few wealthy people who have run for governor before who have made it not completely true and more people pay attention to the governor's race so it's easier for somebody's message to get across right. without spending a ton of money than it is at the local races. For state In last year's Senate and Assembly elections, the 212 races in the state, only three people who were outspent wound up winning. So it's one of the best indicators available at this point in time of who will wind up controlling in the... And small. before we run out of time, let's pop that last, po that last graph there up on the screen. Sure. I found this interesting as well. We don't have all the numbers once again, but this shows the money raised by incumbents running for the 212 legislative seats versus their challengers. And as you can see, historically, it's been about an 8 to 1 Republic or an incumbent advantage. Well, this year, it's actually gotten even slightly higher. It's about... Well, I'm sorry, it's been 4 to 1 in the past. Well, this year it's about 8 to 1, hmm. which is interesting to me because there's a lot of voter anger against incumbents this well, that's year, supposedly. What we think, right? So but, we're, not, we're not sure, actually. But this shows that incumbents are actually doing a better job fundraising than they historically have, which could be a good indicator for them in the fall. Well, or they're terrified. <laughs> yeah, they, they could be trying to fundraise more, or it could just be that some of the grassroots donors who typically give to challengers don't have the money due to the recession to fund these campaigns that they have in the past. So to so tomorrow, actually, we should be able to see everybody's numbers, including Rick Lazio's numbers. I will be anxiously awaiting your emails right. and your spreadsheets. I really want to thank you, Bill Mahoney, because you do a great service to all of us, and then we give that information out to viewers and to readers. So thanks very much. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me.